Hello, my friends. This is Teacher Stefan bringing you close reading. Let's read some passages and answer some questions to check our comprehension of the material. Using a timeline, which is a visual rep representation of dates and data. A timeline is a tool that we can use to help us understand history. It can tell us what happened at different times. You can look at the picture below. In 2012, there's a light bulb. In 2013, there's a hand like this. In 2014, paper, a house, a lock, a microscope, or a magnifying glass, rather. A timeline can tell us how much time there was between two events. So my birthday was March 20th, 1995. I turned five years old. My birthday last year, I turned 30 years old. That shows the gap of time that took place between those two dates. It can give us a better picture of dates in our minds. And that's, that helps us see how they all fit together. <clears throat> now, timelines aren't only for old events. People still use them today. They can help us keep track of important dates in our lives, like our birthdays, anniversaries, graduations. You can even make a timeline for yourself. And note that a timeline doesn't have to be just the past. It can be up to this year, and you can make forecasts for the future. Hopes, wishes, dreams, aspirations that you wish will come true in the following year. Have you heard of New Year's resolutions? What about future New Year's resolutions? In five years, I want to be at this job. In 10 years, I want to have this many children. <clears throat> a timeline looks a lot like a number line when you begin. Draw a straight line across the page. Make little marks for the important events in your life. Your timeline might begin with your birth, right? Include things like the first time you walked, the first time you spoke, when you chose your favorite color and when you started school. It might show the year that you were in each grade and the year goes on one side of each mark and the data on the other. Yeah, the event or whatever it is that's important to you goes on the other side. And here are some sample timelines below. You can see that in 2003, I was born. In 2004, I walked. Then we leave space, 2005, six, seven, 2008, preschool, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and so on. You can plot out your whole life this way. It's fun. These are timelines. So what is a timeline? Can you think of it in your own words? You can also use our definition here a tool with dates and information to understand the past and possibly the future. Why do people still use timelines if it's not just about historical events? Well, people like them because they can be personal. You can keep track of important dates and events and memories in your own life, just like a photo album. What kinds of events should be on your timeline? That is really up to you, right? Whatever is important to you should be on your timeline. What does the story say? It gives examples such as your birth or the first time you did something like eating, walking, speaking, starting school, riding a bike, learning to swim. What is on a timeline just besides the events? What's the very important crucial key that you need? Well, you need the date, right? You need the date to keep everything in order, to know how old you were and what year it all took place. Now you can try to make a timeline that shows three events from your life. Maybe the first time I fell in love, the first time I traveled outside the country, and the first time that I beat my dad at a game of basketball the timeline.
Next, let's talk about the pitch and volume of sound. Sound can be measured. Bing. Some sounds are low and some sounds are high. Pitch is how low or high a sound is. This pitch, this pitch, this pitch. An object or instrument that vibrates very slowly makes a sound with a low pitch. Wah, 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 wah. One that vibrates very quickly wah, 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 makes a sound with a high pitch. And you can check the picture below. <clears throat> Have you ever noticed the different instruments that play in an orchestra? Right, you have the violin, the cello, you have trumpets, you have trombones. Now sound travels in waves, like the waves of the ocean. The vibrations from the instruments reach your ear. You hear them as a sound. The bigger an instrument is, the lower the sound it makes. A tiny flute called a piccolo has a very high pitch. A full-size flute has a much lower pitch. And a violin's pitch is higher than a viola or a bass. A trumpet's pitch is higher than a tuba. Right? The bigger those sounds are, the, the slower and lower the waves and sounds will be. That's why you think of maybe a young boy up here and a big man up down here. Volume is different than pitch. You can use more or less volume to make a sound, right? Even at the same pitch. Ah, little volume. more volume and you can make music or your voice louder or softer volume and pitch work together to make sounds next time you hear an instrument play listen to the radio or even just listen to someone's voice as they talk or sing see if you can hear the difference between the volume and the pitch <clears throat> in this story we learned about sound and two of the best ways to distinguish or define a sound is by its pitch. That's how high or how low it is and its volume. That's how loud or how soft it is. So what is the measurement of low or high sound call? Is it volume? It's pitch. What is the measurement of loud or soft sound call? Is it pitch? No. It's volume. How does sound travel? By light? By air? The story teaches us in waves, through the air. And it is much slower than light. What pitch would the sound from a large instrument have? Hmm, a larger instrument. The passage teaches us that the larger it is, the lower the pitch will be because the longer the waves will be. And what pitch would the sound from a small instrument have? The pitch would be a high pitch because the waves are smaller and vibrating more quickly. How things move. Ooh. We can watch things around us move. When something is in motion, it changes its position. Objects can move from one place to another. They can move in many directions. If you roll a ball, it might move in a straight line. It might also move in a curve. A swing can move back and forth. A light switch can move up and down. Fans have blades that move in a circle. Okay. So think about the different ways objects move. A ball is round and it rolls. A square donk, donk, moves one face at a time. A light switch clicks and sands 
go around and around and they oscillate. This is called oscillation. And they also rotate, rotation, like the propeller on a plane. <clears throat> if you want to know if something is moving, you can compare it to other things around it that are not moving, right? This hand is not moving. Therefore, we know this hand must be moving because it's changing its position over time. Okay, so <clears throat> if the things behind the object are changing, the object is probably moving. If they are not changing, the object is probably not moving. And we know this intuitively, right? We don't really need to be taught this. We are kind of born knowing this already. But you can measure the distance an object moves, right? This is where science comes in. Just measure the distance between where it was when it started to move and where it was when it stopped. And distance can be measured in millimeters, centimeters, inches, feet, yards, kilometers, miles, whatever. Those measurements are in the customary system, meaning that most countries, most people, most societies, most cultures use the same ones, right? I included millimeters, centimeters, meters, and kilometers because we use those in Canada. These are called the metric system. Right. Now, distance can be measured in inches, feet, yards, or miles. This is called the customary system of measurement. And it is not the most popular, in fact, even though it is used by the United States. The most popular around the world that is used by the most people, the most countries, societies, customs, and cultures is the metric system. This uses millimeters, centimeters, meters, and kilometers, thousands of meters, the metric system. Which system does your country use? Now let's answer some questions. When something is in motion, what does it change according to the passage? its position, that's right. How does a swing move? Well, a swing moves side to side. <clears throat> no, a swing is meant to move back and forth. How does a light switch move? Think about it, on, off, on, off. It goes up and down. How can you test if something is moving or not? Well, you can compare it to other objects around it that are not moving. And what is one unit of measurement you could use to measure distance? Oh, there are many. Inches, feet, yards, miles, meters, kilometers, millimeters, centimeters, or just your finger. <laughs> and that's how things move. Plant life cycles. Every living thing goes through changes. Living things grow through different stages. Then they reach the end of their life cycles and die. There are many kinds of plants. Each kind has its own life cycle. Many plants start their life cycles as a seed, as you can see in the picture. The seed needs certain things or it will not grow into a plant. Sometimes seeds wait in the ground until they get the things they need. They wait for warmth from the sun. They wait for water. When they have what they need, they start to grow. A tiny little sprout will push out of each seed. The sprouts stretch up until they poke through the dirt and into the air. Okay, so we're talking about living things, animals, plants, whatever. And we can talk about the life of any living thing in a cycle, because that is how our universe works in terms of life. Think about us. <clears throat> we are born, children, young adults, adults, old age. In that time, maybe we give birth to new children and then we pass on. And then those children begin again and pass on 
as their offspring and children begin. This is the circle of life or the cycle of life. Here we are looking at a plant. It starts as a seed, it grows into a seedling, it becomes a juvenile, then an adult. The adult produces flowers, which come from fruits that give us more seeds. Have you ever bit inside the core of an apple? You will see an apple seed. That could grow into an entire apple tree. That's the life cycle of an apple. The plants continue to grow when they get sunshine and water. The stems grow taller and the leaves unfold. More leaves and stems grow on the main stems. The adult plants grow flowers. The flowers of many plants make fruit and the fruit has seeds inside it so more new plants can grow. More details about the life cycle. New plants look like their parent plants. Did you know? <clears throat> Just like humans. Seeds from a parent plant will grow into the same kind of plant as the parent. An orange tree won't grow into a peach tree. When a seed begins to grow, it is the beginning of another plant life cycle. That's the beauty of life. It is a cycle. Birth, death, regeneration, forever onwards to infinity and beyond. What is the process of living, growing, changing, and dying called? It is called a life cycle. How do many plants begin? They begin as a seed. What two things does a seed need to have with it in the ground to be able to grow? Think about plants. Do you have one in your house? How do you take care of it? It needs water and sun. Where can you usually find seeds in an adult plant? You can find them in the fruit. Open a guava, a mango, a banana. There are little seeds in all the fruits that you eat. Some are easy to find and some are harder. Some are big stones and some are very tiny. Strawberries, blueberries, every fruit has a seed. What kind of plant will a seed grow into? Is it random? No, it will grow into the same kind of plant as the parent. It has the same genes. It is going to live out the same cycle. Push and pull. When an object is not moving, it is said to be at rest. It will stay that way unless something makes it move, some energy. The power that makes other things move is called a force, an energy force. A force can be a push or a pull. They are opposites, right? And it changes the object's position. Think about a door. You can push it open or pull it shut. When a force moves an object away from it, this is called a push. <clears throat> because it repels, it separates. When a force moves an object toward it, that is called a pull, right? And that's an attraction because it brings them together. You can use pushes and pulls to move objects. So pretend this was one object. I can push it or I can pull it. A soccer player sees the ball coming towards him. He can use a push to make it go where he wants it to go. In this case, the push is a kick, right? A little girl wants to give her stuffed animals a ride in her little red wagon. She uses a pull to make the wagon move along after her. Push and pull. Every push and pull takes energy. Yes, it takes energy to move something. The amount of energy and strength you need to move an object depends on how big the object is, right? The bigger the object, the more energy is required to move it. Think about pushing a big rock or pulling a sled. If it's very big, it might be even impossible for you. 
right? Because it's too much strength for you to move it. Large objects need a large force to move them. And similarly, small objects need only a small force to move them. My cell phone is small. It's very easy. But this card is even smaller, which makes it even easier. When an object is at rest, how will it begin to move? It will move when a force strong enough makes it move. What are the two kinds of forces called? Push and pull. What is it called when a force makes an object move closer? That is the pull. What is it called when a force makes an object move away? That is the push. And how does an object's size make a difference in push or pull? Right here. It determines the amount of energy and strength needed to move the object itself. The larger the object, the larger the push or the pull. The smaller the object, the smaller amount of energy that is required. Push and pull. Limited resources. Resources are things that we use. Natural resources come from Earth. Many of our natural resources are limited. This means that they will not last forever. Some resources are renewable. This means the resource can be replaced or grown. Okay, resources are things we use. Limited, non-replaceable. Renewable, replaceable. <clears throat> For example, you can plant a new tree when you cut one down, right? You take away one tree, but you plant another. But other resources are not renewable like trees. This means that they cannot be replaced or regrown. Once they're gone, they're gone. You can dig coal out of the ground. But once this coal is used, it is gone. Why? Because things like coal and oil, these take millions of years to be created. And not in our lifetime will we ever get another amount of this. It will take millions and millions of more years for the next generations to receive their oil from the ground. Now, many of Earth's natural resources are limited. Natural, think about stone, water. When you try to conserve a natural resources, protect, conserve, make it last, you use less of it so it does not get used up so fast, right? To conserve the rainforest, we prohibit or we stop people from cutting down the rainforest. But then of course we get less wood, we get less timber, we get to use less of the resource. One way that people conserve fuel, like gasoline, is by riding a bicycle or walking. I bike everywhere I go. Now, this may work well when the distance is short. And we really learn that we don't have to drive everywhere. But it's a give and take, right? You take more of this, you have less for the future. You use less now, you have more for the future later. Now, water is possibly the most important natural resource. We all need water to live. We can conserve water by making sure that our pipes and faucets do not leak. Right behind all of our walls, there are pipes with water. We can also conserve water by making smart choices. One choice is to use the dishwasher and washing machine only when they are full. Another choice is to turn off the water when you brush your teeth. That one I hope everyone is already doing. Yes, we can all make a difference. What is a natural resource? Look at the photos here. You can see a breakdown of natural versus, rather renewable versus non-renewable resources that are all natural. Solar, wind, hydro, biomass, they come from the earth. 
or from the solar system, right? The sun is very far away, but reaches us eventually. Non-renewables such as coal, oil, gas, stones also come from the earth, but once they're used, they're gone. <clears throat> so what is a natural resource? How can you answer that question? A natural resource is something we use as humans that comes from the earth. What is a renewable resource? Mm -hmm. Think about that breakdown. A renewable resource is a natural resource, but one that can be replaced or grown like a tree. What does it mean to conserve a resource? Mm. Well, it means you use less of it, so it doesn't get used up so fast. Conservation. Why is water such an important natural resource? Well, think of your own life and how much water you use. The most important point we can say here is that if we didn't have water, we would die. Our bodies are mostly made of water. We need to consume water every day. Did you know that some people have lived for over a month without food? But if you, if you don't have water for more than a couple of days, your body will end. We need water in our food, in our drinks, on our bodies. Give an example of something you will try to do to save a natural resource. So for me, teacher Stefan, I ride my bike everywhere I go. I save energy by not using a dryer. I wash clothes only when the washer is full and I set it to the save setting. Okay, I buy most of my food and products from local sellers. This means the transportation is limited, okay? I try to live a peaceful life and leave as little of a footprint upon the earth as I can. Using land in different ways. People use land in different ways. Some areas have a lot of open space. Some areas have buildings close together and people living near each other. People choose the type of community they want to live in. They think about their interests and their worth, all right? So I didn't have a lot of money, but I wanted to live in an open place. So I live in a studio with no walls next to a field with cows. <laughs> I have very quiet neighbors, but I am a quick bike ride to downtown and I have the ocean in my backyard. A rural area has few homes and businesses. Like where I live, there is lots of space in between buildings. Rural areas are perfect for people and businesses who want to grow plants for food or raise animals and live a peaceful, quiet lifestyle. Most states have some rural areas. You just have to leave the populated urban downtown. Now an urban area is a large city and the places near it. Okay, that's the city center. Think about where the politicians work, where the corporations work. Many people live and work in the same large city. Every state has urban areas. You will find public transportation like buses in urban areas. Many of the buildings also have modern designs. There are many things to do and see in the city. That's where you find the museums, the theaters, the beautiful parks. Again, the gardens that are to impress tourists. It's all packed into the urban city center, the best restaurants. Now, a suburban area, also called the suburbs, is located outside a big city, but not very far away. In suburban communities, many people live near where they work. The suburbs do not have the crowds that are in the city. You will find more space between buildings. There are houses and shopping centers in suburban communities. Personally, these are my least favorite. They are not urban, but they are not rural. 
they're kind of just floating in between. And they're so new that they don't have much of a personality. But they are very safe, they are great for families, and they are close to both urban and rural. So we have rural, urban, and suburban. What is a rural area like? You can find it here. Right, these are more the farmlands, the big open spaces, few homes and buildings, right? What is an urban area like? Think about your city center. This is where people live and work in tight spaces, public transportation, modern designs, lots of tall buildings, lots of things to do, lots of noise. What about a suburban area? It's kind of like the in-between, right? There's more space than urban, but less space than rural. Not as crowded as the city, but more crowded than the farmland. There are some houses and some shopping malls, but it's devoid of a real personality. Why do you think most farms are in rural areas? <laughs> they almost all have to be, <clears throat> right? Think about how big, how vast a farm of crops are, the rice fields. Could you have that in the middle of Beijing? You need space, you need room to grow plants and raise animals. A farmer couldn't afford the land if it was in the middle of downtown. Do you like rural, urban, or suburban areas best? Why? You already know my vote. I loved living in a city when I was younger. I had energy. I was excited about understanding who I was. And I met so many interesting people who showed me so many cool and different hobbies and ways to live. When I grew older, I wanted more peace and quiet. I knew who I was. And so I know what I like. And I wanted those things around me like nature and friendly neighbors. What about you? Maybe you want a family and suburban life is better for you. Cause and effect. Cause and effect is one way to explain things that happen around us. Many things happen because something caused or influenced them to happen. Sometimes it is hard to look at a cause and figure out the effect. It may help you to start with the effect and use your reasoning skills to work backwards. Think about all the things you know that could be reasons for the effects you can see. Now, this first paragraph is very abstract. Okay, it's very theoretical. What do I mean? It sounds nice, but because we're just talking about a concept, it's difficult to understand. We need examples. We need practical advice. So I'll make it very simple. Imagine a broken window. This is an effect. When you see a broken window, without even wanting to, you are already thinking about what was the cause. The effect is after. The effect is easy to see. It's the before that makes you think. What caused the broken window? Maybe it was old. Maybe a bird hit it. Maybe someone threw a ball into it. A ball being thrown at a window is the cause for the effect of it breaking. Cause and effect. Here's another example. You may see someone putting on a heavy jacket. Maybe the person is going outside into very cold weather. Maybe the person works in the penguin pen at SeaWorld. <laughs> Maybe the person is going to visit an ice skating rink where the air is kept very cold. All of these things could be a cause for the effect of putting on a heavy jacket. <clears throat> now let's think about this example. The effect is that the student had to go to the principal's office. What are the possible causes? Or what is the reason, right? We see an effect and we ask why. A caused B. We see B, Y with A. Maybe the students bullied another student. 
Maybe the student is just being picked up early. Maybe the student is being given a prize. For the same effect, there can be many possible causes. So here, the effect is that your clothes are wet. Give me two possible causes. How about I fell into a puddle? Therefore, my clothes are wet. Or I was outside and it was raining. The effect is you got an A plus on your spelling test. What are some causes? I studied hard. The test was easy. In your own words, explain something you learned about cause and effect. I learned that cause comes first, effect comes after. How about a string of cause and effects? I woke up early, therefore, I had more time to study. Therefore, I did better on my test. Therefore, my parents were happier. Therefore, I received more birthday gifts. Therefore, I had more toys to play with my friends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One cause and one effect can change the course of your entire life. So always work on being a better person, a better friend, happier, healthier. And the difference in your life will be amazing. What is gravity? You may have seen pictures of astronauts. They float around in space. They fly in a space shuttle. Have you ever wondered why they float? Your feet stay firmly on the ground. Why don't theirs? When you drop something, why does it fall? The answer to these questions is something called gravity. It affects everything we do. Yes. We live our entire lives thinking that everything falls down. But this is not true. Gravity is actually an attraction between small things and big things. And what you're feeling by not flying is actually the earth itself pulling you towards it. In space, there is no gravity. Things don't fall. They just are. Many years ago, a man named Sir Isaac Newton wondered about gravity too. He watched and tested the way things move and fall on earth. He wrote his ideas down. Scientists today use a lot of his ideas. Those ideas are now considered laws of science. Gravity is a force that makes all objects attracted to each other. The bigger the object is, the more it attracts things, right? The bigger you are, the stronger you are, the harder you pull. Since nothing on earth is bigger than planet earth itself, all the things and people on earth are attracted by earth. Everything is pulled toward the center of the planet. <clears throat> and that is why things fall to the ground. It is also why people and things stay on the ground instead of floating around in space. Earth is even large enough to attract our moon. And that's why we can see it in our sky. And that is the craziest part of all. The earth is so big that the moon has found a perfect balance where it is continually attracted to the earth. To blow your mind even more, the moon around the earth goes around the sun because the sun is bigger than the earth and the moon. And so we have all of these little things going around bigger things, going around even bigger things in a perfect balance of gravitational attraction. Why do your feet stay on the ground instead of floating? According to the passage, my feet are attracted to the earth because of gravity. Who was the scientist who did experiments with gravity and motion many years ago? It was Sir Isaac Newton. Why are things and people attracted to the earth? Because the earth is our home. Because of the laws of gravitational attraction. The earth is bigger than we are, and gravity makes things attracted to the bigger object. 
What can we see in the sky because of gravity? The moon. What would it be like if there were no gravity on Earth? Well, the Earth would be completely empty because everything would just float away into space. So thank goodness for gravity. Many ways to measure. There are many different ways to measure. There are many different tools to help us too. You can use a tape measure or yardstick to measure height. Height is how tall someone or something is. For example, I am five feet, eight inches, or 172 centimeters. <clears throat> to measure a person's height, start where his or her feet touch the floor from the bottom, and then stop as you go up at the top of his or her head. You can measure the height of objects that same way. When you measure weight or mass, for example, I am 150 pounds or around 66 kilograms, you are measuring how heavy someone or something is. You can use a scale to measure weight. There are many kinds of scales. You may have a scale with a dial. Other scales have digital numbers. You may have one in your bathroom for weighing yourself although I'd recommend against it. Don't check your weight every day. A scale can be used to weigh objects. Some things are very light, and so they don't push down, which does not push the needle. But if it's heavier, it pushes the needle more, and that's how you can gauge the amount that you weigh. A spring scale or a balance scale work better for measuring light objects. They are more fine-tuned. So we have measured height and weight. And what about temperature? This is how we measure if something's hot or cold, if the day is sunny or if it's going to be freezing, whether you're sick or have a fever. The best tool for sure for measuring temperature is a thermometer. And different kinds of thermometers help you measure temperatures inside and out. Look at the pictures for all the different tools that we can use to measure. What do you call the measurement that tells how heavy someone or something is? Weight. What do you call the measurement that tells how hot or cold something is? <clears throat> Temperature. Hot soup cold ice cream. What do you call the measurement that tells how tall someone or something is? Mm, height. What is one tool that can be used to measure weight? Find it in the story. A scale. There are many types of scales. And what is one tool that can be used to measure temperature? A thermometer. That's it for me, Teacher Stefan. Thank you very much. I'll see you again very soon. Bye-bye.